Hello, I'm Kathy Nash with the ACES staff, and I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, which is entitled Introduction to the W3C Data Catalog Ontology. And this is sponsored by ACES and DCMI. Our distinguished presenter today is Peter Winstonley. Our moderator is Jacob Jett, who is the webinar coordinator for DCMI, and we're glad to have them both with, with us. Um, I just want to ask the audience uh, to please use the question panel box on your screen. Uh, as you have questions during the presentation, just type them in there. Uh, and then once uh, Peter has finished his presentation, Jacob is going to uh, moderate all of the questions. So feel free to ask questions, and this is going to be a great webinar. So I will now turn this over to Jacob, who is going to introduce our speaker. Jacob? All right, thank you, Kathy. Yeah, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Peter Winstonley. Um, Peter is an ontologist, has been an ontologist for many years, um, and he works with uh, a company called Semantic Arts, where he works as a consultant and a consulting ontologist, developing ontologies in many industries like banking. Um, Peter has also been associated with the W3C for a number of years, and he serves as the co-chair for the uh, W3C's data set exchange working group. Uh, and as part of that, the data catalog ontology is one of the outputs of that. And he's here today to present uh, DCAT to us. Uh, and without further ado, Peter, please take it away. Thank you very much, Jacob. And hello, everybody. Um, it's uh, a real pleasure to be here today uh, and uh, to have this opportunity to tell you a little bit about uh, the work of the Dataset Exchange Working Group, which is a W3C working group that's been going for over four years now, working on um, a few deliverables. One of them is the uh, data catalog vocabulary, and the other is to do with um, uh, content negotiation by profile. And both of these are relevant to the modern world as we uh, have more machine-to-machine -machine, um, interoperations with regard to data assets, where we not only want to be able to discover data assets, but we also want to be able to bring them in, computer-to-computer, machine-to-machine, uh, with the minimum amount of human intervention and the content negotiation by profile is an important part, I think, of that, where uh, we're looking at, uh, once we've discovered some data, we wanna be able to bring it in with the minimum amount of fuss, the least amount of human uh, engagement with it, whilst we aggregate and summarize and so on, these data assets. So uh, we're taking a very broad and a very forward-looking view uh, but I want to start my talk going back a little bit because um, we've been in this game for many, many years. Necessity is the mother of invention, as Plato said, and from the days of the Ebla Library, which is in the middle here, and there's some uh, uh, tablets from there on the left-hand side, and even coming forward perhaps a thousand years to Hammurabi's steel, which is a um, black uh, pillar of diorite there, there's been a need to make our information organized and to make it discoverable. Now, reference data such as the laws and things like that has gained much greater importance um, as we've been bringing these sort of things together into units. The other thing is that we need to make sure that our information is, uh, is durable. And uh, so we take a look and see that people like Hammurabi have moved on to these materials like diorite rather than using clay. So we have data that's uh, that's uh, organized so that it can be found and that it's durable and incorruptible. Moving forward, maybe about four millennia, it was a humble playing card that started the movement of using individual cards for each item in, for example, a catalog of books. 
And as the cards became standardized to a particular uh, set of dimensions, so the surrounding technology uh, developed. And you can see here what was the traditional um, very long drawer that was specifically designed size uh, to hold card catalogs. And this is a technical advance that couldn't have been thought of by those in the Ebla library, but I'm sure that they would have appreciated uh, the capacity that we had then to, uh, to catalog lots of information assets. And moving forward, what we have been finding in recent years is a move from the sort of private ownership of information assets, because the wealth of these assets wasn't available to everybody, wasn't available as a societal good. And the advancement of the internet meant that the marginal cost of distributing information was close to zero. And so it strengthened the argument for the free access um, to information that was paid for out of the public purse. In particular, where this didn't infringe personal privacy or some aspects of political or commercial sensitivity. And this, in recent years, with the advent of the World Wide Web, became overwhelming and so developed the open data movement. And this spawned legislation in many countries and a plethora of organizations that were focusing on promoting open data and helping people in public and non-profit bodies to make their, make their data public. And the call by Tim Berners-Lee and others for Raw Data Now, and the demonstration by people like Hans Rosling and others that the insights made possible by aggregating data from multiple institutions um, led to uh, deep insights that would be otherwise uh, unavailable to people who didn't have uh, access to these information from multiple institutions. It gave this movement uh, much greater uh, impetus, much greater significance. Many of us have all been part of that, uh, either as, as producers of information, as processors, or as recipients of, uh, of the goods of these uh, open data movements. And it was against this backcloth that Vasilius Peristeros and others started to work on a framework for publishing data catalogs on the web using the RDF model. I was talking to Vasilios a couple of years back, and this is the story that he told me about how the DCAP vocabulary started. It started when he was at Derry, University of Ireland in Galway, where he saw the vocabulary that they were developing for um, uh, publishing information on shared interlinked open communities. Uh, and he thought, wouldn't this be a great idea to use as a, a model um, for putting together information uh, on the web about data assets? And so he was working with uh, Fadi Mali uh, and also collaborating with Richard Zaganiak, Michael Hausenblas, and others who are uh, well known uh, names in uh, the, the development of the web uh, and of uh, information assets on it. And they came out first with um, a, a data cataloging vocabulary that was um, managed uh, under the, um, the W3C e-government uh, group. Um, and then it later fell into the normal standardization process going towards the W3C recommendation, and it had its own uh, group. Um, the first publication of the recommendation was in 2014. And if I can manage to change my slides here, 
Yeah. Then what happened was that Vasilios moved uh, away from Galway and moved to the European Commission. And the European Commission was um, involved, as with other public bodies, on amassing uh, not only its own data assets for open publication, but also was encouraging all member states to be doing exactly the same. And so Vasilios brought in the data catalog vocabulary, but recognized that it needed uh, more, more terms added to it for the different requirements of, uh, of the commission. Um, and it became the foundation of the metadata model for the European data portal um, and so on. But there were certain verticals that recognized that they had something a little bit different to what was involved in the uh, material that was um, most generally catalogued using the uh, data catalog. Um, AP stands for application profile. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, these were the statistics area and the geospatial area. And so they started developing their own application profiles uh, of DCAT. And that was the history that Vasilios uh, gave me. And I think that it's useful to relate that to everybody here um, because these were early days and we're still working on the journey that they started, but it's good to know where everything came from. So this is the model of the first version of DCAT. Small number of classes, much of it reusing elements of uh, the Dublin core. And um, this, was, this was a really useful start. It was a simple model, uh, but it needed in, it needed enhancement for it to be used in, in the real world use. There were certain lessons that we have from uh, that period. It was really useful to uh, bring together like-minded people to have a small number working on the start of uh, DCAT in Galway and to reuse the good ideas. But the other thing that came out of the history lessons here was that actually there was an early realization that the product, the early version of DCAT, needed to be modified in order to be ready for prime time. And the other thing, looking back, and this is something that W3C is um, paying attention to now in their process 2020, but there was the realization that the standardization process isn't really that agile. And that when we discover problems, it's a bit too late to repair the, uh, the standard. And it takes a bit of time to come back and, uh, and go through the process again. And so the process is changing and that's for the good. So here I want to show you, without the detail, but I just want to sort of uh, give an overview of the increased complexity that the application profile um, uh, has over the original uh, data cataloging uh, standard. So there were a lot of things that needed to be added for it to be really used uh, within the cataloging of open data assets within uh, European community member states. And also um, there was a similar degree of complexity for the models that were prepared for the statistics and for the geospatial verticals. And in fact, there were a rather large number of different application 
profiles developed either for um, these verticals such as the transportation, um, the European plate observatory, which is a geological thing, or the um, application profiles uh, for specific uh, countries such as Italy and Germany and Norway and the US and the Australian uh, uh, open data, government open data group have their own version uh, that is an application profile of DCAT as well. So from all of these, it was possible to start looking at what we might want to do in a second version. And here is roughly the sort of shopping list of version two. There were a few other things, but this was the list of what made the cut. So there were certain terms where there were either domain or range um, uh, constraints that prevented the reuse uh, of terms in, in other settings. And so it was seen that there was a benefit in loosening the constraints um, to promote reuse. There is, of course, the challenge in doing this that you, that you slacken off uh, some of the meaning that these axioms provide into your model. But um, what uh, the thinking was, uh, both within and out with the working group, was that there would be a, a standard that other people would then apply their own veneer of constraints and additions in the form of an application profile. And that was already a, a pattern of uh, activity that was kind of well understood. Um, and so we were going with that. We also realized that um, uh, it was worthwhile having some extension points. And so um, a generic uh, DCAP resource class was added for um, uh, an extension point. Um, and that was the superclass of uh, the DCAT dataset. And we'll look at these uh, shortly. From the geospatial area, people don't normally go about downloading whole geospatial data sets. They usually take what they want out of a service. And so we needed to be able to describe data services here. And we also still needed to be able to handle the case of loosely structured catalogs where we have just a, a, a loose bag of assets that people want to catalog as a particular uh, set of data items. It was also recognized that we needed to have uh, ways of representing data set provenance and quality. And then as the ecosystem of um, uh, data catalogs on the web was uh, also spilling out into the work of the schema.org group, uh, what we wanted to ensure was that there was an alignment between those, between DCAT version two and schema.org, um, partly because um, of, of the strong placement of Google in aggregating catalogs globally, uh, that they, they would normally take a look at schema.org, but they also take a look at catalogs presented in DCAT for aggregation. So it seemed sensible that if we were going to pick any crosswalk, that that was the one that we actually did. And this is the resulting model. Uh, I'll go into this in detail, but you can see that it's slightly more complex than what was in the version one of DCAT, but nothing like as complex as 
uh, is in the uh, uh, the DCAT application profile. The role of DCAT, the positioning of it, is uh, seen as a kind of common denominator. There are many uh, other approaches towards cataloging data assets, but these tend to be very specific for certain uh, uh, domains, certain verticals, and DCAT is seen as being a, a lingua franca across all of these. So the simple model um, that covers most of the core bases is what uh, is being promoted here, um, where the expectation is that you will take this and perhaps add to it in different ways. So the fundamental class here is of a DCAT catalog. A DCAT catalog makes use of uh, uh, Dublin Core and uh, RDF schema uh, and FOF uh, vocabularies um, and really comprises uh, a bit of discovery and descriptive metadata plus um, a set of entities that represent data sets, and that's the core of the catalog. Drilling down a little bit along the spine, a data set needs to have a, an identifier and then a range of metadata again, making use of a a fair set of, uh, of uh, doubling core terms and some DCAT terms that were added. The critical distinction that we have here, though, is that a data set might not be what people use in uh, their work with uh, the items of a data set, but they may actually use a distribution. And a distribution uh, is very similar to the idea of a manifestation in the sort of FUBRA context, where uh, we may have something like a, a CSV or an Excel or a turtle distribution of a specific data set. And this particular distinction between um, the, the data set and the distribution gives us a lot of flexibility here with the model, but it also presents um, challenges to do with how we model the data. Do we model uh, several uh, assets um, as data sets or do we have one asset as the data set and then others as a distribution and these are all kind of modeling choices that have to be made they're the sorts of things that uh, are going to depend considerably on the life cycle of uh, data, the usage of data, whether or not you're using distributions to, for example, um, serialize subsets that remove um, personally identifiable information. A lot of the uh, discussion on whether or not you're going to uh, distribute uh, or whether you're going to consider um, uh, assets to be a data set and distributions or several data sets is also going to depend uh, on uh, issues to do with uh, versioning and also to do with governance and so on. Um, but these are assets that are um, asset classes that are available to you when you're using, uh, when you're using uh, DCAT. I mentioned earlier that distributions can be available via data services. And data services are distinctive in that uh, 
uh, they have uh, things like uh, an endpoint URL. So there needs to be some way of accessing this service. Um, the uh, data set uh, can be provided uh, by um, a data service and um, a data service uh, can um, uh, provide uh, distributions. And each of these can have their own metadata. Sometimes there's duplication uh, of things like descriptions and so on. Uh, but it's part of the work of uh, modeling up your uh, data catalog to decide how you want to put, how you want to partition the information. So what I thought I would do next is just to sort of run through how you might start using the data catalog vocabulary. When we're talking about um, doing this, we can start off with the catalog. Generally, people use RDF, but it's not mandatory. You could use XML, for example. And the other thing is that you may have multiple data catalog entities, or you might just have one. And you can have a catalog that points to other catalogs. And this was an issue with version one that's been resolved in version, version two. So you want to start off putting in some basic um, metadata about an identifier for the catalog and uh, details of the publisher. Um, then a theme taxonomy and rights and policies are the next sorts of things to go in, particularly if this is going to be uh, something that's publicly available. And dates and so on. And now you've got a kind of core framework of a catalog where you want to begin to start adding content. And the content is going to be data sets and data services and distributions. Um, but although this is something which is at the moment set up for data sets and data services, there's no reason why it isn't used as a catalog for any other type of asset. Because remember that data sets and data services are just subclasses of DCAT resource. And so that's an extension point. And what we can do is create other classes to represent other resource types. So data sets are described uh, in RDF as uh, entities of type data set. And they may have been derived from other data that's not necessarily specifically curated as a data set. And we can describe these as uh, entities of type DCAT resource. But we add the identifier of the DCAT data set to the catalog. The entities uh, that are the data sets are often um, something that is prepared as part of a, a workflow process. And so we can describe um, how the data set entities are generated by uh, steps and plans using uh, the PROV um, or the PPLAN uh, vocabulary, so we can use the PAV vocabulary. And so um, in this way, the process of, of generating and curating the data set items that are in the catalog can be enriched by linkage to uh, lineage provenance information 
using these uh, vocabularies. So a data set, as I've been describing earlier, might be the key asset that everybody accesses. But in many instances, the data set uh, is curated and managed, but for practical purposes, people use distributions. And this can be so that you have something that's more attuned to the business process that you're engaged in, where it's in the right format. The other thing about these distributions is that a distribution may be accessed through a data service. So the data service is the sort of thing that you would put into play when you have uh, data that's too large to use a single download. And the type of metadata that you would have is very similar to that which is used to describe a data set, but there is the additional um, uh, endpoint, the access service uh, for the distributions, and so on. Now, sometimes we need a bit more metadata about uh, the event of creating a data set or the event of uh, creating any other asset that's in our catalog or the catalog itself. And for that purpose, there is the class of catalog record and it's there to act uh, as a, another, another place for uh, adding more metadata but kind of keeping it clean and separate uh, so that we know that it's not about the uh, data set or the data service but it's about the event of the creation of the record of that data set or data surface so that we can add more metadata there and that really is the the core classes of the spine of the um, uh, of the data catalog vocabulary. It's really fairly simple. There are other edge cases that are perhaps uh, historically important, and they're likely to become less so as we get better at uh, cataloging our information. So sometimes, as I said before, in uh, particularly in the situations of public sector open data, there are uh, bags of files. There's no sort of sense of a distribution uh, from a, a single data set. Uh, but what we can do is bring things together using doubling core terms relation. And that's uh, the convention that we have adopted. The other um, point of consideration for a lot of people is that uh, data sets are related to publications and this is key to the implementation of the FAIR principles which started off in academe but are actually being adopted much more widely and so again we can use uh doubling core uh is referenced by predicate in order to link um uh, in order to link to uh, things like publications and papers and so on the examples that i've taken uh here uh, come directly from the document on the W3C site of the DCAT uh, recommendation. And I encourage you to go and take a look at that because there are lots of examples, and illustrations of how to implement DCAT. Quality metrics are also uh, 
important when we're describing um, data assets, not just quality, but also some uh, notion about usage patterns and other issues of, of pragmatics. And uh, the DCAT uh, recommendation has uh, illustrations of how we use the W3C data quality and the data usage vocabulary. Uh, and again, if you if you go and take a look at the recommendation, you'll find plenty uh, of illustrations there to help you. These are all uh, written out uh, in in uh, RDF turtle serialization. Um, they're pretty straightforward to read, and you should be able to then uh, implement those uh, quite easily in um, uh, in an RDF way, but uh, it's not too challenging to begin to think as to how you might bring them into an XML document uh, if that was what you were wanting to do. Now, I'd said earlier that one of the things that we were doing was reducing the axiomatization of things like uh, DCAT keyword uh, and enabling them to be used across a wider range uh, of uh, domain class types. And I also said that this kind of like reduces the meaning in the model because it's through the tight axiomatization that uh, that we apply um, what, me, what we mean for the particular asset types and their relations. So what is routinely done in these situations is to apply additional external constraints through a shape language like shackle or shex. And if you take a look at the ways in which this is being done within uh, the European Commission in the development of the DCAT application profile, you can find uh, shackle files, an extract of which is on the right hand side of this slide. Uh, and that will give you a, a, a starter in getting something ready for yourselves. Versioning is a complex issue. We might have versions of data set, data service, distribution, uh, API, and so on. And we started looking at this uh, when dealing with version two and decided that it was going to take much longer time than what we had. And so we moved to uh, doing this in version three. And at this link, which you will get in the slide stack later on, uh, there's a link to the GitHub discussion uh, where we've got a number of different uh, points that we're considering in the sprint that we're doing on versioning. There are a few other things in uh, version three that are being discussed, but the principal one uh, the principal addition is versioning. So why do you choose DCAD? Well, there are many other vocabularies that we have uh, for describing and cataloging data sets, serif, data site, the ISO 19115 for the geospatial and schema.org. But to reiterate the point that DCAT is there to provide this lingua franca across catalogs it's focused on publishing on the web. It really is an interoperability standard. And that's the reason why we feel that it has got an important place knitting together these other standards, which are richer and more domain specific. So where can I go and see? Well, there are lots of different places where you can go and see DCAT in use. It's used within not only the European data portal, um, but other national data portals. And they are moving uh, their application profiles from being based on DCAP version one to DCAP version two. 
Within the uh, EC, the uh, Joint Research Centre has its own data catalog, its own data catalog application profile, and this is based on um, uh, version two. And there are a range of other catalogs uh, that use DCAT. DCAT is also being used within industry. Um, and so it's something which has already found quite wide use, um, very strong sponsorship from within uh, different governments with regard to their uh, open data and other related cataloging um, activities. I've already mentioned some of those. The bulk tend to be within the European Union, but also um, on data.gov for the US and within uh, the um, Australian linked data efforts, DCAT uh, has got a, a very prominent position. It's also used in publishing platforms such as Zenodo. So here are a few references uh, that would help you quickly find not only the recommendation, but also the European Commission's work and um, the work in uh, Denmark, which is perhaps um, the most advanced of each of the European member states. So I want to conclude by saying that there are a lot of people involved in this work, and you can see the bulk of them here. And uh, these have been involved uh, over the past three to four years in developing DCAT version two and continuing the work into DCAT version three. And we expect to be able to make a public working draft available of version three, perhaps within the next one to two months, probably before Christmas. And so I would like to conclude there and invite you to ask questions. All right, thank you. Uh, excellent presentation, Peter. I'm gonna, so I don't see any questions coming in immediately. However, I had one myself. Uh, so I think you mentioned that um, XML was another one of the ways that we could serialize uh, DCAT metadata. And I'm wondering if any work has been done on uh, a context document or a JSON schema to also kind of facilitate JSON or JSON-LD serializations of the, of the data standard? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not aware of anything, Jacob, um, but that doesn't mean that it hasn't been done. There's an awful lot right. of, uh, of work out there. Well, what I am pointing out, though, is that um, it's not mandatory to do this in RDF. I and mean, it's perfectly reasonable to use this approach uh, in order to uh, organize your catalog. The key thing, I think, is to recognize a distinction between a catalog and the cataloged assets, and also then between um, a data set and a distribution. I think that those are the sort of two uh, main things to have, that there's actually some recognizable entity, which is a catalog, um, and that uh, we might have distributions of the same data set. And perhaps also that when we're thinking about a data set that we can actually mint the identifier and begin to lay down some of the metadata before we've even populated it with one data element. Uh, and so I think that, that uh, a lot of this is to do not with the serialization, but it's to do with uh, thinking about how do you organize uh, a catalog, what's the uh, 
what's the sort of general approach towards doing this when we're dealing with data uh, and uh, how we can use it in order to um, overcome the challenge of having multiple records when what we have is um, different representations of exactly the same data set. In other words, that you have uh, minimal uh, shift in, um, in information content between different representations. So they should all uh, be in some way uh, related and and uh, having a data set and uh, distributions is an ideal way of, of dealing with that. Awesome. I think that makes a lot of sense. All right. We have some questions. Uh, here's one from Karen Coyle. Does a catalog imply ownership and could a catalog have data sets from a number of different owners? So, um, it it it's entirely possible that a, that a catalog can have data sets from uh, a range of owners, but normally speaking, a catalog would be under uh, some single form of 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 governance. But there's no reason why that isn't uh, um, a consortium. Uh, but a data set is uh, is a publication from a a single entity. Yeah, and I might add, putting on my librarian hat, I think a catalog implies stewardship over the data yes. set, but not necessarily yeah. ownership. Yeah. All right, here's another question from David Fitchmuller. Have you done a mapping to other standards you mentioned like schema.org or data site? So there, there is some vestigial mapping, but we haven't done a formal one that we would maintain. All right, and then we have a question from Benjamin uh, Riesenberg. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, was the uh, VOID vocabulary a part of the environmental scan for the DCAT work? Um, is VOID seen as having significant overlap with DCAT? Um, the answer is yes to both of those, uh, uh, and um, if you if you go and look into the uh, the, the various materials uh, that we have um, within the W3C uh, uh, wiki and and so on, there, there will be uh, all of the discussion about how we brought together. Um, the different things that we did, but there is definitely references to VOID in the, in the past. All right, uh, here's a question from Tom Baker. Uh, how is DCAT metadata typically created? Is it created by the creators of the data sets or the creators of the catalogs? Um, is it created more in a decentralized way and harvested into a portal? Uh, or is it created by more centralized teams of catalogers? So um, a little bit of uh, all of the above. Um, so some of the ways in which it's created, Tom, come from uh, the ways in which different teams put um, data into portals like CCAN, and, uh, and then it gets exported from that as a unified whole. Uh, that then gets vacuumed into things like uh, European Open Data Portal and so on. Um, and uh, uh, other, uh, other teams and approaches uh, do the cataloging of assets as they bring them into the catalog. So the, there, there are different uh, approaches that are, that are done. But the um, the metadata for uh, a particular data set is something that should be uh, ideally put in place predominantly by those that are actually curating uh, the data set. Though that isn't always feasible. All right. 
Um, there's a question from uh, Kai Weber. Uh, there have been many standards promising to solve the problem of machine-to-machine -machine interoperability. It seems at some point they always fail uh, in the sense that they've not actually worked across platforms or across data stores as people hope for, right? And for example, things like XML, SOAP, ISOCAT, UML. How does DCAT prevent um, the pitfalls that earlier standards have fallen into when it comes to interoperability? So I think that the challenge here is perhaps more social and actually getting the right sort of use cases to fully test out uh, the interoperations of data across domains. And uh, I think that this is going to be tested with the, um, the types of activities that uh, the Research Data Alliance and others are doing um, in in regard to their uh, promotion of, of uh, the FAIR principles. Um, so th the challenge I think here is getting communities to start working together uh, and putting some of these standards like DCAT through uh, much more rigorous testing than has been done to date. Much of what I've seen tends to be interoperability within uh, the partners of a, a single domain. Um, and um, so I think that you're absolutely right that, that these are big challenges. I think that uh, it is uh, one of the um, one of the areas where in order to develop uh, large enough um, data sets, to do things like machine learning on, we're forced into uh, trying to aggregate information across uh, many different um, large organizational units like, uh, like nations or across different domains. And that um, our hope is that the, that the DCAT uh, will improve discoverability, uh, whether or not it actually leads to making the information assets that are discovered in that way um, easier to aggregate is a, is a completely different kettle of fish. One of the things that the European Open Data Portal has discovered is how um, the quality of cataloging can be quite variable. Um, and it is through taking a look at the lessons learned uh, in the analyses of different national open data catalogs by uh, groups like the European Open Data Portal uh, that we can uh, find um, points at, at which we can make significant improvements to help this interoperability. But I think it's an ongoing journey. Yeah, I would agree. Interoperability remains tricky and like not the least of which is because uh, the standards like RDF invite us to keep inventing more and more vocabularies, uh, which sometimes cross uh, talk across one another. All right, I think we have enough time for just one more question. Uh, I have one here from Marsha Zung. Uh, for those already made uh, who have already made application profiles based on DCAT number one, uh, will the second version require significant activities in order to have their application profiles updated? and being implemented to those data catalogs that already use, uh, sorry, um, they're already using their application profiles. Uh, for example, the US has a project open data metadata schema. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, so Marsha, one of the things that we were wanting to ensure with version two and subsequent versions is backward compatibility. Um, so there shouldn't be any uh, change um, for you there. The, the benefit that you have is uh, more classes available uh, in order to uh, better um, describe data services, for example, and the ability to uh, use subclassing of DCAT resource in order to give you uh, scope for um, 
catalog entities of other asset types. So um, uh, there's not nothing's going to be broken looking back the way, but going forward there is a much richer um, uh, ontology that will help with regard to um, uh, better cataloging going forward. All right, excellent. Um, I think we've reached uh, the top of the hour. Uh, and so um, let's all thank uh, Peter once again for this excellent presentation. Uh, if you folks have additional questions, I think you can email them to me. Um, I'll type my email address quickly into the, yeah, there we go. Kathy's already done it. Uh, and I'll forward them on to Peter and who can answer them better than I can. All right, thank you everyone. Um, and thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I'd like to really thank Peter and also Jacob for moderating uh, the questions. It was a terrific webinar, a great attendance, so I hope the attendees have enjoyed it. Um, the handouts, as you may have seen, are on uh, in the website. You can download them. Um, and I'd also like to remind all of you uh, that one of the ACES member benefits is complimentary access uh, to all webinars. A recording of today's webinar and a copy of the slides are going to be posted to the ACES website and will be available uh, to all registrants. Uh, within 24 hours, you're also going to receive an email with a survey um, attached. Uh, please fill out the survey within seven days. Your, um, your feedback is really important to the success of our future programs. Again, I'm Kathy Nash with the ACES staff, and I thank everybody for attending, and I thank uh, Peter and Jacob. This thank concludes the webinar. Thank you.